Hi, and welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. I'm Robert Bryce. On this uh, show, we talk about energy, power, innovation, and politics. And my guest today is Robert Hargraves. He's a co-founder of Thorcon International, uh, which is a, a startup nuclear company. Um, Robert, welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. Thank you. Glad to be here. Now, I didn't warn you about this, um, and uh, uh, but I the custom on this podcast is for guests to introduce themselves. So I've given your title, but uh, imagine you've uh, just arrived somewhere and you're in a meeting or something and uh, nobody there knows you and you have uh, 45 or 60 seconds to tell them who you are. Go. Go. I have a checkered career. I majored in <laughs> mathematics at Dartmouth. Uh, got my PhD in physics at Brown. Came back to Dartmouth and taught mathematics, introduced computer science. But I founded a software company. And my career ended up being a vice president at MetLife and then being a consultant in information technology management. Eventually, you're running information technology at a, a medical devices company and then retiring in uh, 2000. So since retirement, which simply means no money, I've been working really hard on the idea of solving our energy crisis, our global energy crisis. And one of the more recent things is becoming a founder of Thorcon International, a company that is trying to develop inexpensive, reliable power plants to serve the developing world. In addition, I, here at Dartmouth College, um, give occasional courses in the continuing education program. And sometimes at the engineering school, I give a talk or two. Good. Okay. Well, that's a good roundup. So I, I uh, want to talk about Thorcon, but before I, I one of the other, uh, we've known each other for a while. In fact, I quote you in, in my new book, Question of Power, and talk a little bit about uh, Thorcon in, in A Question of Power. But before that, I want to talk about this piece that you published in the Wall Street Journal uh, some weeks back. It was March 7th. The title is Net Zero Carbon Emissions More Like Not Zero. Um, and you're, you're, the concluding point you made here is that uh, uh, net zero is a new word for indulgences to emit CO2. Tell me, tell me what, what led you to write this piece. And, and uh, you mentioned Amazon, Google, and then in, that in your view, this is a kind of a, I, I don't want to use the word swindle, but that, but a head fake. A, 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 what, tell me what your, what your point is there. It's, it's an example of uh, wordsmithing is taken to, to extremes. Um, Certainly, the people who are concerned about global warming want to have less CO2 in the atmosphere. And so you would think that they would endorse zero CO2 or absolute zero. Uh, but in fact, what's happened is the argument has been changed to be net zero. That is, people say, well, we can emit some emissions, but if we reduce those emissions somewhere else in the world, the net is the same. So the, the whole focus is now on the net side rather than the zero side. So we have all these schemes to sort of trade the green credits uh, among the various polluters, if you will, if you believe that CO2 is a pollutant, uh, that are dominating all the conversations. So in New England, we have the region. To interrupt, your point is that, that it, it, and you must make this specific point in the piece that you talk about uh, that they are using uh, renewable energy credits to to achieve this um, this this claim, right? That Amazon or Google are running a data center in a in a certain neighborhood, but they're buying renewable energy credits from somewhere else that may be a thousand miles away, and claiming that that energy is their energy. Is that was that the gist? That, of that is what's happening. Uh, if you really press the negative, say it's, it's the equivalent to the same thing. Uh, but the renewable energy credits were used in that way sort of as a marketing tool by these companies. They're also used by states like the state of Massachusetts, which mandates that a certain amount of their electric power must come from, say, solar panels. Uh, and they don't have enough solar panels in the state to do that. So they buy solar renewable energy credits. And there are many little marketplaces, I say little, millions of dollars, uh, for varieties of renewable energy, whether it be wind or photovoltaic solar or community solar or rooftop solar, all these things are trading money back and forth. Uh, Biden's latest plan has yet another form 
of uh, such credits, not, not yet fully formulated, but we're focusing on a, on a kind of accounting. And if we look at CO2 emissions, they keep going up and up and up. But there's a lot of money that continues to change hands as we do all this sort of accounting that's taken place. So, so you're, you, then let me just make, see if I can, uh, because I, I, I understand your argument and other people have made it, but you're just saying that this is an accounting trick, a marketing, you use the word marketing tool, but it's an accounting well, it is trick. A marketing. Yes, it is, of course, because everyone wants to be clean and green nowadays. And so it makes sense for these companies like Google and so on, who have large data centers to uh, say, well, we're going to offset our electric power that's generated by a nearby natural gas plant or something like that by uh, helping others with their energy needs elsewhere in the world. Uh, a common example is reforestation in places like Brazil. People say, if we could plant more trees, they could absorb carbon, and that would offset some of the emissions that is being, are being generated by our supplying natural gas plant. So the question sort of is, who keeps track of this marketplace? Uh, is it uh, a, a reputable accounting firm like Deloitte or Pricewaterhouse or something like that? But the people who enforce all these rules are what I call cheerleaders. They're the companies I never heard of, Vera, Gold Standard, Greeny Climate. These are the people whose business is to go to industries who say, I want to be green and say, I'll sell you or show you where to buy green energy credits. So there's a whole marketplace in this sort of thing that, that's taking place and is diverting the focus on where is the energy actually coming from? Is it the only sources of energy really that can provide the world with inexpensive uh, clean power are hydro or nuclear power, uh, wind and solar work, but are intermittent. And so can't really drive an industry. Well, so that's, and that's the nub of your point here. You're, and you end it by, you, you, you make this point, you, I'll read what you said. Net zero is a new word for indulgences to emit CO2. So I, I see when, when I fly, I haven't been flying much lately, but no. you can buy these carbon credits and, and somehow get, get absolved of your guilt. There, there's something that smacks of some religiosity here, doesn't it? Well, and, and, and nomenclature, net zero is the name that appears in almost every news article you read about this. Now, I'll give another example, natural gas. It used to be that we powered our city's gas mains with city gas, which was done by heating coal up really hot and spraying water on it. And that methane and um, carbon monoxide was transmitted through the pipes to run all the stoves. Right. But when the oil industry got bigger and we had excess gas coming out of oil wells, someone dreamed up the great idea of piping at the cities to burn in stoves and furnaces. And the marketing term was not methane or butane, it was natural gas because it's a natural effluent from an oil well. Great marketing. Same great marketing being applied to clean coal right. or carbon capture or net zero. So we have to look beyond the simple words and say, what's really happening? Well, that's a great, that's a good breakdown. And I'm, uh, the, uh, we can talk more about Nat Gas, but let's, let's move to where your real focus is these days, which is, and, and, and I think the, the thrust of some of what you wrote about in the, in your piece in the Wall Street Journal is, yeah, you're, you've got these accounting tricks, you've got these marketing tools, but if I'm reading your involvement in Thorcon, your point is we have to go nuclear in a big way. And that, that is the, if we're going to be serious about CO2 emissions, then we, we need huge amounts of new nuclear capacity. And that's the gist of what you're working on with Thorcon. Is that, is that fair? That's exactly the point. Um, we believe strongly that nuclear is a great solution because it can be delivered, can deliver reliable energy that's potentially very inexpensive. Now, our experience most recently in the U.S. has been miserable. The only nuclear power plant that's being built is the one in Georgia. 
And it's very expensive, three, four times the original budget. It costs on the order of $10 per watt of capacity to generate electric power. And this is really out of sight. A natural gas plant and, and, can be and built you're talking for $1. Just, right. And you're, and you're talking about Plant Vogel, which is being built by Southern Company in, in Georgia, uh, Correct. near Augusta. Correct. Um, far over budget, far over over uh, the expected timeline. It's been, I mean, I think it's, um, my, they, my, Georgia Power folks might not like it, but it's been rather a disaster for them in terms of the the economic impact and 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 so on. And this is after the the cancellation of the the Sumner plant in in South Carolina, right? Which cost, could cost repairs right. ten billion dollars. So, but your your point about nuclear being. It, it, you said the word miserable, and I think that the, yeah, we're seeing a miserable outcome now with nuclear reactors closing. So, what is Thorcon doing that's going to change this paradigm? That's because the issue is building nuclear at scale and doing it quickly. Is that is that right? That that is the issue. Uh, it's just difficult to see that from the U.S. point of view right now because it's been so expensive. Uh, let me review the U.S. just for a minute. It's been expensive because of the regulatory costs because of the fact that we don't have a supply chain within the U.S. to do that because we hadn't built nuclear plants in so long, and because the original contractor that was developing it was really incompetent, just unfortunate. At the same time, in South Korea, nuclear power plants have been being built for a third of the price that we're paying for the Georgia Vogpool plant. A third. And those companies in South Korea are just completed four such nuclear power plants in the United Arab Republic for about that price, about three dollars per watt of capacity. So, and that's the Baraka plant, right? The the correct. nuclear plant, the El Baraka, correct. and the first reactors there just recently started up, as I recall. The first right, reactor right. didn't start producing power in United. Yes, it Arab, did. United it's, Arab Emirates, right? Right, and and they're slowly bringing the others up, and I think they've all been basically completed, but they're in the process of testing. And commissioning and so on. Well, that's going to happen. The um, our point is that we need to do that worldwide. I mean, the world's use of energy today is about three thousand gigawatts on average, and that's mostly consumed by the EU, the US, a lot of China, and so on. But we have a whole developing world in Southeast Asia and Africa that's going to want more electric power. And today they burn more coal. Uh, we've mentioned that I think that China just built last year 38 gigawatts more of coal-fired power plants, as did India. All these company countries, they need that energy for their people. They want to grow their commerce. They want to grow their capabilities to refine steel, uh, to make cars, all these to, to make vaccines, all these things require a lot of electricity. And, and they're and, those, and, those, and to interrupt Bob because uh, Robert, and that's it, right? The, 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 it's it's Pilkey's iron law, right? Roger Pilkey Jr.'s iron law. Countries are going to act in their own self-interest. They're not CO2 emissions are not their first concern. It's the health and welfare of their people. And governments that don't attend to that don't last very long. I mean, that's that's his fundamental point in the iron law, which is is it and it's is that fair to say that's why the Chinese are building so much coal capacity? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Um, you know, before we pick on China too hard, uh, understand China has also uh, erased or taken down or or destroyed a lot of coal power plants. Sure, because of the old ones weren't as efficient. But if you build a new coal-fired power plant, you can use pulverized coal. You can use high-temperature steam and so on, and make it more efficient. So, uh, you know, we could have been doing that worldwide and still be burning coal but with less uh, CO2 emissions, but we, we haven't. So our objective is to provide that energy with the least expensive power plant that we can that can be mass produced, in, in our case, shipyards. The founders of our company have a background in shipbuilding. They designed and oversaw the building of the world's largest super tankers at the time, perhaps 15, 20 years ago. And they used the same technologies for design work that we're using today at, at Thorcon. 
So these uh, are the so these are the very large crude carriers, VLCCs, right? Which exactly. is the, the, the term for the, for those giant 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 uh, oil tankers. So, it, but I, this is the, one of the, the main things, and I'm, I'm glad we talked about the journal piece. And, and but that this is seems to me the challenge for any new technology is being able to scale it up and to be able to scale them. And 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 why is the internal combustion engine achieve such incredible efficiency gains? Well, we we make them by the tens of millions every year, right? And they get a little better and a little better and a little better. But if what I'm hearing you say though is that we're building nuclear reactors in onesies and twosies, and we need to build them in tens and hundreds. And that, right. So why are shipyards, this is the key question. So why are shipyards the way to go here? What is it that shipyards offer that building bespoke projects like the AP 1000 at Plant Vogel or, or the, the European pressurized reactor at, at Flamanville or in France or some of these others, what's wrong with that model? And what does the shipyard model cure? Uh, the, the shipyard model adapts to the sort of design that we have put together in the liquid fuel power plants. The shipyards have uh, industrial experience in producing large tonnage of ships every year. Uh, we have gone to a large shipyard and gotten estimates of the price and the time it takes to bend and weld and put together that much steel. And it's less than one year for one of these plants. Now we have outfitting to do. There. Now, now, to interrupt here, so I just, and I interrupt a lot when on this podcast. <laughs> so you, you said you've gone to shipyards and I'm assuming that the biggest shipyards are in China, Korea, and Japan right now, the, right? And, the and, three and, largest ones are in South Korea. Okay. Uh, uh, and and uh, we have now a uh, informal arrangement with, with DSME, Daiwu Shipbuilding and Marine Engineering, which is, I think, perhaps the very largest to be the uh, engineering procurement construction contractor for our products. So the advantage of the shipyard is, again, that the skills are there because they build multiple ships every year. All the specialized machinery for steel building and building is there. Uh, the scale idea is such that we have designed our ships to fit in the slips that the shipyards use for building their car cargo carriers, their oil tankers, and so on. So we haven't, we're not just designing a power plant, we're designing power plants that can be scaled and mass produced. We believe we could. A single shipyard could produce dozens of these ships, these power plants, these hulls, every year, each one capable of generating 500 megawatts of power. So, so to follow on that point, because that's the key here, isn't it? I mean, that when I look around the world, and I'm, I'm adamantly pro-nuclear, been adamantly pro-nuclear for you know more than a decade, writing about it all this time, but the problem is getting it to scale up. And in the meantime, while we're waiting for scale, waiting new ideas, waiting for paper reactors to become real reactors, what are countries all over the world are doing? As you just discussed, we're building, they're building coal plants, they're building gas-fired power plants. But what you just said was that a single shipyard could build potentially dozens of power ships, right? These would be ocean-going vehicle, ocean-going vessels that would be towed or under self-propelled, but dozens of them in a single shipyard at 500 megawatts each. So you're able to produce gigawatt scale nuclear in a single shipyard every year? Yes. Uh, a shipyard the size of DSME can probably produce 30 gigawatts of power plants a year. Again, there's which outfitting. Would be, which would be as much as the coal plants that China deployed this year or, or last year. That's correct. That's correct. Now, the shipyard can't build the most expensive part. The most expensive part is the steam turbine generator system that converts heat to electricity and but the temperature that our product our power plant uh, creates is high pressure steam uh, at 550 centigrade and so on which is the same uh, spec that is used for coal-fired plants so well, there is going to be from our product a demand for steam turbine power plants but that can be met by the companies that are providing the steam turbines now to the coal-fired 
power plant constructors. So, so those so those steam turbine generators, those are machines that would be built by Alstrom or uh, Alstom or GE or or Mitsubishi Heavy Industries. Those those exactly. kinds of exactly precisely those, the people we're talking to. Yes. Right. So those uh, are the companies that you 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 would be able to build the reactors, and I want to talk about the reactor design in just a minute. But you'd be able to build the nuclear reactors, putting out high pressure, high power, high temperature steam, which increases your enthalpic efficiency, right? But then, and that then the the component that you wouldn't build in the shipyard, you'd have to source from other places, and then you drop that in the ship, and you're off. You're on the high correct. seas, ready ready to go. Is that is that it? That that is correct. Sounds simple. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. If I can interrupt just to, to remind everyone who's listening, my guest is Robert Hargraves. He's a co-founder of Thorcon International. They're available. Or you can find them on, on the web at thorconpower.com. He's also the author of a book called Electrifying Our World, which is, uh, you can see all of that info. Uh, Bob, correct me if I'm wrong, electrifyingourworld.com. Just right. Thorconpower.com and electrifyingourworld.com. Okay, so let me jump back. So you've given us kind of the overview of what Thorcon wants to do, and I want to talk about what uh, the the issue is here, or the the technology here, the uh, high temperature, low pressure reactor. But tell me when you started Thorcon, and 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 what, uh, how long you've been around, how much money do you have, how much money do you need? Uh, well, Thorcon was started about five years ago. Uh, we've had investments from people who were interested in solving the world's energy problem, particularly energy poverty in the developing nations. Uh, the issue of scale is an important one. Uh, we, the most recent investor is uh, uh, Chris Anderson, who's the founder of the TED Talks. And what attracted him was the scale capability. Uh, he's interested in working to solve this problem. And, and so he was attracted by the fact that we are a small outfit, that we focus strongly on safety, as everyone does in this business now, and that we have a scalable product, and that it meets the one important point that's essential, and that is cheaper than coal. It's got to be less expensive for the power plant, and the electricity has got to be less expensive if the developing nations are going to adapt and adopt this new technology. So when you say cheaper than coal, so we're talking, what, three, four cents a kilowatt hour? How, what's, the, what's that target uh, you think yeah, you can produce we, it for? We, we estimate and broadcast, if you will, that we should be able in mass production to produce these power plants at $1.2 per watt of capacity, which is about the same as a natural gas plant. Coal plants, when you add all the scrubbers and things to it, they're going to be around $2. Uh, and the coal plants cost a lot of money because they have to handle so much coal, 10,000 tons a day or some such terrible number. We expect to produce the power coming out of the plant at three cents per kilowatt hour. That's before any government taxes, fees, or whatever, and so on. The well, three cents, but three cents would be competitive with pretty much any technology anywhere in the world right now. Anywhere in the world, uh, yes, um, even natural gas. It's really tough, though. And if you were in Texas uh, with a natural gas power plant uh, on a pipeline that didn't have to go far, you could probably be three cents a kilowatt hour. But right. most of the world cannot. Right. Um, and a lot of solar and wind promoters say, "Oh, well, we can meet that," but it's an intermittent source. It's not an it's not a a base load source of power. It's not, and not only that, uh, the prices that we see quoted by outfits uh, like uh, Bloomberg, New Energy, and so on uh, forget a lot of costs, and they forget the almost two cents per kilowatt hour uh, credit the the federal government gives, for example, that gives a little cost advantage. They forget about the cost of all the undersea cables that have to take power from offshore wind and bring it into the grid and so on. So, uh, but the biggest disadvantage of those sources is the intermittency. Uh, coal, natural gas, hydro, nuclear, all can provide the kind of continuous energy you need to run a, a auto manufacturing plant to run a hospital, 
have a modern economy. Well, right, exactly. Yeah. So, so let me. I, I want to. I'm like I said. I want to talk about the 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 high temperature, low pressure reactor, the the liquid, um, the, the the molten fluoride salt uh, that you're planning the the fuel cycle. But I want to talk before we get to that about the ship power ship itself because um, in in a question of power in my documentary Juice we talk about power ships and we saw them in Lebanon offshore Beirut. Um, right. and these were power ships that were uh, Turkish built um, owned by uh, Karen D's holdings and they were running on heavy fuel oil and they were just big reciprocating engines inside and they were highly polluting, but power ships like those are very common around the world. So what is the, it, it, I know the answer, but please explain why are, why is that power ship model so potent as a way to deliver electricity, particularly in developing countries? What is the power ship offer that you, that uh, advantage that you don't get by trying to put something on shore? One is the rapidity of installation. Uh, we claim that if all the permits are in place, uh, we could eventually provide a ship with 500 megawatts of power in two years from the point of order, uh, because the the shipping company, I'm sorry, the shipbuilding company can do it in about one year. We need some work at the site, for example, power lines, for example, the cooling water channels, and so on. They have to be built to uh, allow the steam generators to work properly, and so on. So. That's a big advantage because it means there's not going to be a regime change oh, in the middle of building such a power plant. I mean, the Philippines built a power plant. It took forever, and there was a lot of corruption that uh, ended up siphoning off money. And the power plant was just about completed but never put into operation as the Marcos regime failed. Uh, and so the, one of the advantages of a power ship is – if you were really uh, adventuresome, you could inventory them and then put them in places like Lebanon at the times that they need the power. Uh, in our case, we are expecting that the power ship will be located uh, semi-permanently at a location that's been prepared in advance. Sure. But it, it, it does mean we don't have uh, five or 10 years of site preparation and site work and protestations and requests for additional funds from uh, corrupt officials and so on. So it, we, we insulate ourselves from that by being able to deliver the product rapidly. And, and by anchoring it offshore, I mean, this is a point that we, that we made in Juice, my, you know, the director, Tyson Culver, and and I made well. So yeah, you have a power ship, and if the customer doesn't pay the bill, well, you take the power ship and leave, right? You pull the anchor up and go home, right? Yeah. Take well, it in, our, in our case, it's a little more than pulling up the anchor. It's pretty firmly uh, connected to the uh, ground. But uh, yes, it, it's a potential to right. be able to do that. Yeah. But the other isn't it the other advantage here though that you've got so much of the world's population lives in coastal cities, right? That the 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 biggest cities are often coastal, and that you have the ability then to float up the reactor right there to the shore, and you you know you're close to the population center. Is that is that the other advantage? Right, and, and the largest rivers of the world uh, are also amenable to transit of a, a power plant such as ours. The other thing to keep in mind is that the new tech. Technology for power lines, uh, high voltage DC power lines in China transmit power over a thousand kilometers. And it's a pretty inexpensive in the sense of not a lot of losses in power at that million volt DC uh, system. Sure. But those are hard to build and costly to build. I mean, they're not. Yes, they are. And especially here in the United States, people don't like them. And it, we, so we don't see interstate transmission, high voltage transmission being built pretty much anywhere in the United States. So, right. which is the other point that I think is key in understanding the importance of nuclear is that you, you can site a high output generation station close to population centers, and you don't necessarily need a lot of high voltage transmission, but that's one of the advantages as well of the power ship, right? That you don't need a great deal of transmission to get it to a, a population center. Right. So uh, I gotta, but, go ahead. Go back to Roger Pilkey's Iron Law again. Just, yeah, I mean, sure. You got to keep thinking about that. Here in the U.S., we have enough electricity. 
you know, is not a great demand for more and more and more as there is in China, as there is in Indonesia and other developing nations. So the motivation for the regulatory authorities and the, and the governments in these countries is such, what can you do for me? Not, can we stop you? Which is what it seems to be in the U.S. Right. Well, and I think that's a key point. I mean, you know, and I have a slide that I, when I'm presenting, electricity demand in the U.S. has been flat for 15 years. I mean, it's just not growing at all, despite significant increases in population. So, but this idea of nuclear power ships, you're not the first one to do this, right? The, the Rosatom has already deployed a nuclear power ship in Siberia and PVEC, right? I've forgotten the name of the, the ship, but the, this has been done now. You, it's not necessarily a new idea that you're pursuing here. You, you, the Russians uh, beat you to the punch with a little bit different technology. Can you describe that? Uh, theirs are smaller uh, power ships. They're for coastal communities on the north coast of uh, Russia. That's, that's true. Uh, the U.S. too had power ships. We put them on barges. The U.S. Army did that. Uh, we floated one down to the Panama Canal to provide power down there uh, at about the time that uh, George Bush was born in Panama. Now, now that okay. Now I don't, I'm not familiar with that. But the the Rosatom uh, power ship that those are two, uh, if memory serves, reactors that were designed for submarines or icebreakers, right? It was seventy megawatts I, electric, something like that. I, I think so. Yeah. I, I'm not that familiar. I believe so. But the Panama power ship you're talking about was that, that was that a reactor? Or was that fuel oil or what was that? No, it, was a, it was a nuclear power plant. It was on a barge that was uh, run by the U.S. in the Panama Canal zone. Huh. Okay. Well, this is, I, yeah. I vaguely remember this now that you say it. And, and about when would that have been in the 1950s? Oh, uh, 60 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> Something like that. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. So let's turn to, to Thorcon's design. And there are, I've had a number of guests on the power, on the power hungry podcast talking about their, you know, which technologies they, they think are going to succeed. Uh, Rod Adams and, and uh, uh, others talking about it. Um, uh, uh, oh, the woman from Oklahoma, who's from Oklahoma, whose name is, is uh, slipping my mind at the moment. She's uh, one of the co-founders there. And Oklo has a, an interesting design. But so you're, tell me about the, the, the chemistry of the Thorcon design and why that matters. What is the, what steps, what's the, the contrast an AP1000 or a light water reactor with the reactor that you're uh, planning to deploy at Thorcon? Sure. When you build a light water reactor, you have fuel rods and they're close enough together that you can have a nuclear chain reaction generating the heat. Uh, to take that heat away in order to transmit it to a power conversion system, you need some kind of heat transfer fluid. Water is a great one but it boils easily over 100 centigrade. So what you need to do to keep the water solid or liquid rather is pressurize it. So these power plants typically are pressurized to perhaps 100 or 150 atmospheres to keep the water from boiling uh, so that that liquid can be transferred to the power conversion system. And there are two of them that are in common use, the so-called boiling water reactor and the pressurized water reactor, they're both at high pressure, but the pressurized water reactor is a little bit more so that the water stays as a fluid through the whole circuit. Um, now, in order to do that, you need a, a pressurized, large pressurized vessel with perhaps six inches of steel walls to contain that 150 or so atmospheres of pressure. Um, in our case, in order to take the heat away, we use a liquid which is molten salt. In our case, they're fluorides of beryllium and sodium. The advantage of molten salt as opposed to water is that it has a much higher boiling point. We don't come close to the boiling point of that sal of the salt, which is around 1500 C. Uh, not only that, in our kind of design, Instead of having fuel rods, uh, we literally dissolve the fuel, in our case, uh, uranium and thorium, in the molten salt. The advantage of this technique is that we can get to higher temperatures than you can with a pressurized water reactor. Now, we can get to temperatures of 700 C uh, coming out of the top of the reactor vessel. 
which goes through a series of heat exchanges to make eventually 550 degrees C steam at high pressure, which we use to drive the electric conversion systems. So the other advantage is that so and so, but you don't. The key there is that you don't have to pressurize that that uh, working fluid. But the Correct. Working, the working to keep fluid. it liquid. We don't have to pressurize it. We so bring up the pressure. You have to simply, pump it, but you don't. But you have to pump it, oh. but it's not. But it's at low pressure. So if, if you have some uh, some accident or something, you're not going to risk some kind of explosion or or accidental release. Is that the is that the gist? That's of right. We, we bring it to about three bar pressure above atmosphere to make the uh, the centrifugal pump that moves the salt keep from cavitating. If you ever had an outboard motor on a boat and you make a quick turn, you'll hear the thing buzz up sometimes, right? When the prop goes too fast and the water can't cling to the propeller blades. Right. Uh, that So you need, to, in our case, just enough pressure to keep that from happening. And three but, bar, and three bar, if, uh, go ahead, you're a physics guy, to explain what three bar is. Uh, well, one bar is about 15 PSI. That's the pressure of uh, the atmosphere. Okay, so three bars, three atmospheres, more pressure. Okay. It's about the it. same as a garden hose that okay. you use for watering your lawn. So uh, roughly three atmospheres of pressure inside this, the working right. fluid, the working fluid right. loop. And, and by having that higher temperature, you get better efficiency out of the steam turbine, right? That's the key for uh, super critical, ultra super critical power plants, right? That they can, for, right. in, in coal, that they operate at a higher temperature. Therefore, you get more work out of the fuel that you're burning. So that Correct. that's, and, and so, and, and, and that, the, but explain how you dissolve that. This is one of the, I've heard about molten salt reactors a long time. You're using regular sodium chloride and you're mixing in some uranium and thorium in there. Is it low enriched, high enriched? What's the quality of the uranium and the thorium? Yes. Uh, for, it is not, it's sodium fluoride in our case. Oh, sodium fluoride, I'm sorry, yes. Okay. A, and uh, and also beryllium fluoride, just because the two of them mixed in just the right proportion have a rather low, lower melting point than them individually. Um, and so, I'm sorry, I have to back up. The question is, uh, what, what this idea, the, the, explain the mix, uh, the, you know, what's, what's in the cake mix here. It's, so it's the cake uh, mix. Okay. Uh, sodium fluoride, sodium and, and, and uh, right. And then uranium uranium fluoride. And you, fluoride. Then you toss uh, in some uranium and thorium as fluorides, uh, uranium, UF4, uh, and also thorium, same idea. So these uh, then in the molten salt are really it's an ionic structure. It's an ionic. This, this is, it's not a solid anymore. The fluorine isn't linked to any particular uranium or beryllium atom, uh, but the various ions in this liquid salt all, is almost like a plasma. They float around and are a liquid. Uh, the reaction takes place there, but just as in a uh, in a light water reactor, we need to slow down the neutrons. And so the key in all these molten salt reactors is some sort of moderator. Uh, in a light water reactor, it's the hydrogen atoms in the water. In our reactor, it's carbon, it's graphite that is in the same vessel with the molten salts. And, and by moderating, that allows you, moderating the reaction allows you to moderate the temperature in, inside the reactor. Is that is right? That right? It, but it really moderates the speed of the neutron. Think okay. of the, the neutrons as going by another uranium atom at high speed. If we lower the speed enough, there's a higher chance that that neutron will interact and cause a fission to take place in that atom. I see. So there are four compounds then in this, uh, in the cake mix here. I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, yeah. This, this about thorium. I'm, I made cookies last night. So yeah, go ahead. What are, what are those compounds? Thorium, uranium, beryllium, and sodium all as fluorides. Right? Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. So they're, they're all as fluorides. So they're, they're compounds, right? A fluoride is attached to each one of those different, the, each of those different elements. Correct. Okay. So, and so in why, um, it, it, you you say then that this can run uh, the 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 reactor itself is is replaced on a four year service schedule 
and the salt uh, is re re replaced and, 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 and uh, removed and replaced on an eight-year cycle. So the can itself, the, the, the thing that controls the, where the react, reactions occur is in a big steel can. That has to be replaced every four years, and the f and but the fuel can be replaced every eight years. Explain how that works. Okay, in our case, we replace the the can because it's made of stainless steel, V sixteen, uh, every four years because we know from experiments at MS uh, at Oak Ridge that we know the life is at least that. Um, we don't worry about having a lifetime of parts that's going to last the full eighty years. The parts that are neutron irradiated. Are replaced every four years because we know from experience that that's a safe lifetime and the metal the, fatigues over that time period so you need to you need to it might reasons. we don't know it could have a longer life but we won't know that so we until we take used cans out and begin to inspect them and see if the life is as short as four years and and how big are these cans bob well it could be maybe uh four meters wide five meters wide and uh, all about as high. So it would be roughly a square. Or, or, well, uh, the well they're actually sort of an oblate sphere is what it looks like in the diagrams. Oh, okay. Uh, so it's, it's not actually like a, like a can of corn or soup. It's more, it's, uh, you call them a can, but I'm envisioning a, a cylinder, but you're, you're, you're right. saying it's not necessarily the, a cylinder. Right. The pot inside the, that contains the reaction is an oblate sphere. It's placed in a big can, like a Campbell's soup can. You're right. Okay. Because it also includes in there the pump and the, what's the primary heat exchange here. All the parts that potentially touch radioactive materials are in that can. So the whole thing is a replaceable unit. And it's about five meters on a side then, something like yes, that. right. About right. 15, 18 feet, something like that. Yeah. Okay. So, the, and, 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 but, so you have to replace the can, but the fuel lasts longer than the can, or at least that's your projection right now. Right, right. We use enriched uranium, uh, enriched to almost 20%, uh, because we want to use, have a, 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 a rather long lifetime. As, as we add more fuel to the power plant, we have to take out some. So the, the most uh, efficient way to do it in our case is to use what's sometimes called high assay, low enriched uranium uh, at almost 20% U-235, which is the, the fissile part of the uranium. And, and how the, does that compare at 20% enriched? Uh, uh, light water reactors are less than that. Single digits, are they not? Is that yeah, light water reactors, modern ones are around 5%. Okay. So it's, it's more. Gotcha. Yeah. And, and, and is that, how easy is that to come by? I haven't, I haven't bought any high oh, enriched it, uranium lately. Where, where do you get it? Who, who can, well, no one manufactures it? it just now. Okay. It, right. It, so it's not easy, but we've talked to the enrichment companies that, you know, they will continue to run those centrifuges for longer times in order to bring the enrichment up from 5% to 20%, as long as there's a market for it. And, you know, they're going to look to us and say, well, how many of these plants are you going to build? And shall we take the risk of changing our production to accommodate you? So it's a big negotiation that takes place. Uh, the very first plant we start up may well have to run on 5% uh, enriched uranium just because of uh, the uh, enrichment the companies might want to say, well, let's see how it works first. That's, that's what the market has now. So you're, you sure. have to have some bespoke uranium yeah, exactly to, to, to for for your optimum operating characteristics is that is that right. fair correct right okay so now the fission it, products are come out of the reaction or uh, stay within the salt uh -huh. the, okay the the actinides so, the, so the well not the actinides so much are the problem but the cesium iodine uh, and so on stay within the salt so eventually, the salt uh, builds up. And you're right, I forgot to, about the actinides. We also make plutonium out of U-238 because as we irradiate U-238 atoms, we make, uh, as a byproduct, plutonium, which is a good fuel. But there are a lot of isotopes of the plutonium that aren't so good. Right. And in our case, uh, we have to be sure that we don't 
puts so much plutonium in the salt that it begins to precipitate. We want it to stay liquid. Right. And so, so this is one of the, this is now, this is getting a little bit into the weeds, but I just want to touch on it briefly here. And, and uh, again, my guest is uh, Robert Hargraves. He's a co-founder of Thorcon International. You can find them at thorconpower.com and you can find his other work at electrifyingourworld.com. Um, but one of the arguments that I've heard over and over for thorium reactors is that they don't produce as many actinides, don't produce plutonium. But what you're saying here, if I understand you right, is that the salt mixture that you're, you're planning to use would actually produce some plutonium that then would have to be refined out when you, when you change out the fuel. Is that right? Yes. Uh, now, we don't anticipate that regulatory agencies are going to allow us to process the plutonium out for many years. Uh, so we plan on inventorying the used fuel in a special place aboard the ship uh, for as long as 80 years. Uh, our, our hope plan is that people will understand that it makes sense that under observations of IAEA or somebody, we do process that eventually to reconstitute and reuse the valuable uranium and plutonium that's in the used fuel. But our objective is always cost. We want to produce electricity at the least possible cost. And so we're not uh, planning at this point in our lives to do any kind of reprocessing of the fuel. We can make that three cents per kilowatt hour number with the design that we have that leaves the valuable used fuel in special tanks aboard the uh, hull. And sure. a, a so let me, let me, let me, let uh, me just challenge you a little bit on that because that's, as you know, the anti-nuclear uh, forces are very strong and they said, well, we can't solve the waste problem. Well, you can't solve the waste problem. You can't build it, you know, and the, and a number of States in the U S as you well know, have prohibitions on building new reactors until the waste issue is solved. So I'm just going to be clear here. What you're saying is Thorcon hasn't solved the waste problem and you're in, and you're just going to say, well, we'll deal with that later. And I'm not being tongue. I'm not being facetious here, but that's, that's the gist of what you're right. saying. Is that fair? Sure. Yeah. Um, but, but the waste problem has been solved many times. It's just, uh, you're right. Uh, there are advocates for no nuclear power plants because of the waste, but I mean, we can, put it in Yucca Mountain, we can bury it in deep wells that the oil industry has taught us how to drill. There, there are options to do that. It's only a matter of political will to pick one or the other. And the other point is that you can just leave the casks in those concrete casks above ground forever and ever. Uh, every, maybe every one or 200 years, you reprocess it to make it smaller. That, that's possible. But there's not much of it. That's the other thing people don't understand. We mine about 60, no, maybe 50,000 tons of uranium every year. We mine about 50,000 tons of arsenic every year. When we mine the uranium, we keep track of every kilogram. We know where it is. We know it's in that concrete cask and so on. Now, I challenge the industry to say, do you know where your arsenic goes? That lasts forever. It's in the environment. It's in products. It's somewhere. We don't trace it, which it's is more dangerous. Arsenic it's interesting, or uh, uranium. That, that scale issue, I mean, 50,000 tons of uranium. I mean, I'm, I'm just on the top of my head, I'm guessing with the probably 50,000 tons of coal mined every day or more than that. I don't know. We use billions of tons of coal. Well, 10,000 tons of coal per day in a coal plant. Right. You know. Yeah. In a single coal plant, right? Yeah, so, right. So, <laughs> so let me follow up on the issue of fuel. And, and one of the things that is kind of it, 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 that I've thought about a lot and we've talked about on, on the Power Hungry podcast before is the issue of government involvement here. And I know that you've been talking with the Indonesian government because it's an archipelago. And of course, it would be a perfect place for power shifts because of the difficulties that we've talked about, right? And you can float, float the barge right up there and, and, and hook it up. But it, it, I'll ask the question this way. How I'm, you can't, it's going to be difficult for you to say, well, trust us on the fuel. You're going to have to have government involvement. So where is the U.S. Fa uh, failed on uh, supporting nuclear where the Chinese and Russians have succeeded? Because those countries are now dominating the, the nuclear business globally. 
what's what will it take? Here's the question: What will it take for the U.S. to get back in the game when it comes to d- deploying nuclear at scale? They'll have to do. They'll have to look hard at why the Volcko plant has been so expensive. They'll have to look at companies like us who five years ago went to the NRC and went to the Department of Energy and presented our plans to do these kinds of testing in Redmond, Washington, uh, and being and learning that it would take at least a decade and a billion dollars to let the NRC rule on whether you could start building one. Now, you can't, as a venture, raise a billion dollars on a bet that the NRC will approve your building the pilot plant. There's no way we could do that in the U.S. So the whole uh, regulatory system has to be changed to accommodate the fact that radiation really isn't all that dangerous. You know, uh, it just it, it just isn't. We use it all the time in medicine. Uh, you know, a, a typical uh, radiation treatment is 60,000 millisieverts to treat a cancer, 60,000. And yet in Yucca Mountain, we're forced to engineer a system that wouldn't allow as much as a tenth of one millisievert over a whole year to contaminate the living space of a tribe that couldn't read the warning signs. Right? Right? That's, so you're that's, saying the regulatory regime is just a mismatch for what it's a mismatch. Happen. It's 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 terrible, and it's partly on the basis of fear. People say, "Well, um, it's if nuclear power is so fearful, we're going to keep you safe." Uh, the J- Japan made the same mistake. They said they had a rule that said originally when the Fukushima accident happened that uh, you, you know you shouldn't have exposure of more than 20 millisieverts per year. And you know what happened there? And then eventually they backtracked and they said, oh, well, we're sorry, we'll make the rule one millisievert per year. So the the choice of regulatory limits is political, meant to appease people who are upset rather than scientific. That's, That's our problem. And the, uh, and it, we're and not, I, we're not, we're, we're, we're using what's sometimes called the precautionary principle. Well, it might harm us. So let's make the rule more stringent. I'll give you two examples just recently. Uh, the J&J vaccine, right? It caused blood clots. Chances of getting one of the blood clots was one in a million. So we suspend that. And during that suspension, the harm caused by people who didn't get the shot is exceeds the harm that might have happened from blood clots by an order of magnitude. So it wasn't science at the table. It was politics. People said, look, if somebody dies because I authorized a shot, it's my fault. But if they die from COVID, that's a natural disease. It doesn't matter. So it's right. A, it's, it's, a, it's a, and well, Chris Kiefer and I talked about this on the podcast a while ago. He's a medical doctor in, in Toronto. He has the decouple podcast that, that there's an ear and, and I've had Jared Geraldine Thomas from the Imperial college of London talking about this with, from the uh, Chernobyl tissue bank, that there's just this irrational fear of radiation that is leading to bad outcomes. And in particular, an inability to deploy reactors at scale because people are just have this, this, misguided fear of, of radiation that's not based on anything based in reality. Right. And we have the CDC saying, follow the science, follow the science. And yet they violate that rule. We have the same problem with radiation uh, limits. We, we don't look at the rules, at the, at the existing rules. I'm a member of an outfit called Scientists for Accurate Radiation Information. And its membership is perhaps one or 200 people who have PhDs or MDs in oncology or radiation technologies and so on, uh, who have published thousands of papers that totally disprove the rules that the EPA uses called lady or no threshold. And yet uh, we cannot get that issue addressed. 
one of our members joined the EPA as the chair of the Radiation Advisory Committee for two or three years. And uh, about last month, he was summarily dismissed, reading about it in the Washington Post at the same time he got a uh, notice from the new EPA administrator, Mr. Regan, uh, because they said the, that these were corrupt industry hacks, basically. Uh, when in fact, these are renowned scientists who publish good papers, but the EPA in his whole tenure there as chair would never allow that group to address the issue of LNT. Uh, so we linear, need, we no, need green, linear no threshold, which is the correct, which is the, which is the, any, uh, any exposure to radiation is dangerous. That's the, that's the, 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 that's correct. That's our problem. So, so if we can get science to really be dominant, in the EPA, uh, then perhaps we can reverse these rules. Uh, we petitioned the NRC five years ago, my signature is on it, to change the rules uh, about that, to drop, to set the threshold at something like 50 or 100 millisieverts per year per person, and drop the ALIRA entirely. And the NRC refuses to rule. This is the standard work. Of and, the and, regulatory and, agencies. And ALARA is as low as reasonably achievable, right? Correct. So, so even if even if you meet the standards, they say, but are you doing it as low as could possibly reasonably be achieved? Right. Uh, enough of even, that. even even though we're we're exposed to radiation all the time. So um let me let me uh, end up because we're, we're we're bring right. things to a close here because we're ta- we've talked for about an hour and I I like to keep the podcast at about that length. So if you don't mind me asking, you told me you retired twenty years ago. So how old are you now, Bob? Ooh, I'm eighty one. So what drives you on this? I guess it's just what drives all of us who found this company is looking at the world situation and saying energy poverty is a big issue. That's why we all got interested in nuclear power in the first place, because it's an inexpensive, reliable source of energy that can help developing nations. Uh, I mean, just for example, if we can raise the GDP per person with power to about $7,500 per year, the birth rate drops below replacement rate. We can solve a lot of the overpopulation problem by just giving people the lifestyles they want and can live by with things like a good electricity. But I mean, they, they need, need, but they need, but they need power to make that happen. They, they need, need power. They need roads too. Okay. Yeah. They need good government, you know, but they power is an essential medium. You need sanitation, roads, highways, power. That's about it. So how much money does Thorcon need to get this reactor going? I mean, you said a billion dollars. Uh, our, our, but- our budget for, for, our, for getting the first one going is something under a billion dollars. Okay. To get the first one. For 500, uh, for a 500 megawatt plant. Right. In a sense, the size of the plant doesn't matter so much. It's, it's all the work that has to go into it. The, uh, but from then on, each plant would cost on the order of 500, 500 million. So, uh, or at a, right about a dollar a watt, something like Correct. that, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, who are your heroes? Who are our heroes? Well, Alvin Weinberg. He's the guy who, sure. at Oak Ridge, uh, led the lab and worked with some of his clever guys to conceive of this idea of a nuclear power plant that could run at low pressure and at high temperature that could provide cheap power for the whole world. Uh, he was very interested in safety and so on. Uh, he eventually complained that the large, large pressurized water reactors uh, weren't as safe as the smaller ones. And for that, he was fired. Huh. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, he's written a lot and we still read his writings. There was uh, just last night a tribute to Alvin Weinberg at uh, the Oak Ridge, uh, uh, some sort of a education center, I'll think of it. Uh-huh. But all his papers are now on exhibit. We use all the papers that have been uh, stored away f- from the original experiments in our design work. 
It's interesting. You're the second one, uh, Eric Meyer with Generation Atomic. I asked him who his heroes was, who his heroes were, are, and he he said Eric. He said uh, Alvin Weinberg as well. So, uh, uh, interesting uh, parallel there. There's still one or two people left from that era that we consult with. Uh huh. What are you reading? What am I reading? Well, uh, I was read. I read this one, of course. Uh huh. Bill Gates' new book, Bill How Gates. to Avoid a Climate Disaster. Uh, it's, it's, good. it's a readable book for the general public. Uh, that's that's good. Uh, he doesn't come out quite strongly enough in favor of nuclear power. Uh, he, he genuflects in front of renewables. Is that uh, I guess yeah, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone, now, everyone has I, I to. I want to show you this book yeah. too, a minute. Uh-huh. I told you I teach sometimes in Dartmouth. Yes. And in this case, I got a bee in my bonnet that I was mad about the hundred renew hundred percent renewable energy folks because they ignore the intermittency issue basically. Sure. Uh, so I, I said, I want to do 100% fission power. So I wrote a book on how to power up the world with 12,000 gigawatts of fission power. And I gave the course twice. I took all the slides that I put on the, uh, in the screen and put them oh, in the yeah. book. But you can get it for nothing if you just go to uh, electrifyingourworld.com. And the nice thing about it is you can click on anything and go to the source. And 12,000 12, gigawatts, 12 terawatts. So just for people listening, the U.S. has about 1.1 terawatts of installed capacity. So you're saying if we had 12x, roughly, and just in, in sure. broad term, if we had 12 times the capacity, current grid capacity of the United States, globally, we, in, 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 according to your calculations, we could electrify all transportation, industry, residential, everything. That's, that's, your, that's your analysis. That's it, right. And I call upon all the various sources in that book that you can click on to find out where IAEA is right or wrong and so on. Sure. Worth doing. My last question, uh, and again, my guest is is Robert Hargraves. He's the co-founder of Thorcon International. They're on at thorconpower.com. Uh, you can also see his website at electrifyingourworld.com. What gives you hope? <sighs> what gives me hope? The hope is that the developing nations will adapt this technology, adopt this technology, and suddenly illustrate through economic growth that it is a good idea and it's not harmful. And they will then begin to compete internationally. And the US and the EU and so on, they'll begin to take notice, say, wait a minute, why aren't we doing that? So I think that's. That's the way we see it. And the other hope is simply that well, billions of people will have a better lifestyle. People who now live in Africa and the Southeast Asian areas and so on. Well, that's a good place to stop. Um, uh, Robert Hargraves, it's been a pleasure. I, I, I've been, we talked some months ago about uh, getting you on the episode, on the, the podcast, and I'm glad we did. I was, we covered a lot of ground and I was <laughs> glad to get some of the drill down on, on the, uh, the chemistry on uh, molten salt reactors. So uh, uh, again, uh, my guest, Robert Hargraves, uh, co-founder of Thorcon International, thorconpower.com, electrifyingourworld.com. Anything else you want to add, Bob, before we close here? Um, no, thank you very much. I really appreciate, Robert, the work you are doing and getting published in so many places. Uh, I read it regularly and uh, hope more people listen to your advice. <laughs> All right. Well, God willing and the creek don't rise. All right. Well, thanks a lot uh, for being on the Power Hungry Podcast. Thanks to all you out there for listening. Uh, Tune in to the next episode of the Power Hungry Podcast. And in the meantime, give me 6, 12, 14 stars and uh, and, uh, tell all your friends to tune in as well. Until next time, uh, see you then.